Good morning, all our branch family, and welcome to our online service. We're so glad that you're able to join us on this summer Sunday. Well, he is back. Yes, Pastor Ken is back, which means he's starting a new series titled, It is a Jungle Out Here. You don't want to miss out. It's going to be awesome. But before we get into the word, our worship team is ready to lead us in song. So sit back, enjoy the worship, enjoy the word, and have an amazing Sunday. God bless. Change. 
out there Disorder and confusion everywhere No one seems to care Well, I do Hey, who's in charge here? It's jungle out there Thanks so much for leading us in worship. Uh, this is the perfect series of talks uh, to begin to understand the greatness of God and what that means for us every day, that he is in control of all creation, that he is over all things. Theme song you just heard as we were coming in uh, is from a TV series, Monk. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about that show or if you've ever watched it or whatever, but the words go like this, and I'm gonna, just going to read the, the end of it. People think I'm crazy because I worry all the time. If you paid attention, you'd be worried too. You better pay attention or this world you love so much just might kill you. Now, I could be wrong now, but I don't think so. <laughs> it's a jungle out there. Now, a crazy song, actually, isn't it? Uh, again, written by Randy Newman. And uh, Adrian Monk, who's played um, in this movie, in this uh, television series by uh, Tony Shahab, was a San Francisco, uh, San Francisco City detective, and his wife was killed, uh, murdered, actually. And so he went into this whole mental illness phase of his life, had a nervous breakdown, it got to the point where he was afraid of 312 things, including milk and ladybugs and harmonicas and heights and messes and food touching on his plate and especially germs. Now, it's actually kind of a funny series, you know, and, and so on and see this guy who's, you know, kind of has this uh, chronic condition of being afraid of all these things, trying to do his job. And then I realized as I began to think about this that this sounds a little bit like 2022 in terms of just what we've recently been through. As I look at what's happened since the pandemic, I've seen a lot of fear in, in people, you know, and it's disrupted everything. I mean, my word, you know, every day well-meaning newscasters from all over the world and so on just kind of filled us with this news, you know, how many people died and how many people have COVID now and medical professionals told us again and again and again how bad it was out there and we needed to stay in our homes and stay away from other people. And the overall message was be scared, be very scared because this could kill you or it could kill somebody you love. There's all, the, all kinds of other stuff that we began to see. It began to be get divisive, you know, between the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers, you know. And, you know, just friendships have been affected by it. I've had friendships that have been affected by it. You know, housing prices, you know, have gone up pretty much through the roof. You know, uh, cost of living has gone up, you know, 7%. Gas prices went from, I think they started out to be like about $1.29, you know, a liter. And now they're up to over $2 a liter and so on. So this is just all over. The downtown core emptied out, you know, and the airports emptied out, you know, and, and all the bus stations. And it was just disruptive to everything. Now, here's what I'm seeing as I work with people. This has left a lot of people stuck in fear, in fear. I don't know if you remember when we started out in this, uh, in kind of at, at the beginning end of the pandemic, and we said, caution? Yes, absolutely. Caution. You need to be cautious. Fear, no, because fear is destructive. Now, how many of you can identify with what I'm talking about? Most of you can. I can't see your hands out there, but I'm guessing that you can identify. It, it, it has really, life has gotten way more complicated. Now, here's what I know, and I want you to listen really carefully because this is so important. In this series, my point is not to minimize danger. My point is not to make light of the heightened awareness that's become part of everyday life. My message in this is very simple. We have to face our fear. You have to face your fear. It's not going to just go away, okay? And that's my second point is the people who have, you know, kind of created the fear, perhaps well-meaning, wanting just to basically bring this pandemic under control, they're not going to come and take it out of your home. It is not going to just dissipate with the air and then one day everything is going to be okay. See, we live in the context of a culture that sells fear. So that's why you have, you know, 24-hour news programs like CP24 and CNN and Fox News, and they sell news. And I know that because they have ads on their news programs and people, you know, pay. And, you know, good news doesn't sell. Bad news sells. And so we're kind of stuck a little bit in the cycle. My skeptical side basically says that, you know, the people who've created some of this fear have found out that it's actually working pretty well. 
Fear gives you power. That's why bullies use it. And people who have power are not usually going to give it up voluntarily in any way. Like I said, caution is always good. In fact, Bible talks about caution. God, you know, when he took the people out of Israel and gave them, you know, some, the, the guidelines and Leviticus and the laws and so on, you know, he basically said to them, I'm your healer, he said, and I'm not going to allow you to get the same diseases as all the people around you. And so what he did was he gave health guidelines for these people that were way ahead of their times before anybody even knew that germs or viruses or anything else existed. And he said, if you follow these, You'll stay healthy, and so on, and people have. Book of Proverbs, it's a book of wisdom. <laughs> it says that there are three kinds of fools out there. There are fools, and they're just people who are misled. They're naive. There are fools that, you know, are always getting into trouble, always going out, and you don't want to, you know, make your best friend a fool. And then there are fools that are evil, and to deal with them, you need lawyers and guns. So <laughs> there's, it, it's a book about wisdom, about how to live. Wisdom, caution is important. But fear, not fear. Fear, you see, when it gets into our hearts, it blinds us to the kindness and the love and the power of God. See, I've found out something about myself, and that is that when I'm afraid, uh, love kind of goes out the window. Love or fear does a lot of stuff, a lot of damage in the interior of our lives. Now, fear is, is from God initially, okay? And the word for it in the New Testament is phobos. You're probably familiar with that. Uh, phobias and so on are fears. So we're just going to kind of do a quiz. Uh, acrophobia would be what? It's fear of heights. Claustrophobia is what? It's fear of closed in spaces. Hemophobia is fear of blood. Monophobia is the fear of being alone. Pathophobia is the fear of illness. Toxophobia is the fear of getting poisoned. Xenophobia is basically the fear of people, of strangers, and zoophobia is the fear of animals. So it makes sense. So fear is something that's part of our lives, and, and good fear is really important. Like there are things that you need to be afraid of, like when the sign is flashing and telling you not to cross the road, you need to, you know, you need to not cross the road because you could get run over by a truck. Now, fear, though, when it gets out of control. You see, fear creates, you know, all of this energy inside to either run fast or fight and so on. And so what happens is that this stuff can actually poison your blood system if it stays in there. And our calling and our mission call us to be with people, to love people. And fear can actually sabotage that. Now, Truth is that fear is intended as just kind of a short-term thing to kind of give us a boost, get us moving, stop us on our tracks, make us think. So that's what fear was intended as. It wasn't intended as being kind of a long-term condition. So there are all kinds of fears out there. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. So I'm just going to see if you can guess which are good and which are bad. My daughter is deathly afraid of snooks. Is that a good fear or a bad fear? Well, if you live in Australia, it's probably a good fear because most of the snakes there are poisonous, okay? But, you know, if you're afraid to go out and garden because there might be a garter snake, it might not be a good fear. So kind of on the rails there. Uh, what about the fear of telling your boss that you think that his idea for the business and, and for the promotion of the business is really, really dumb? It's probably a bad, it's probably a good fear, right? You don't want to do that. Uh, you've got a suspicious lump on your body and you're scared to death to go and get it checked out. Is that a good fear or a bad fear? That'd be a bad fear, right? Because you need to get it checked out. What about the guy who's afraid? His wife is trying on a bathing suit and he wants to be authentic and she asks him, does this bathing suit make me look fat? So would a good fear be, you know, to be afraid of being authentic and saying what he thinks or feels and so on? Probably that's a good fear. You don't want to do that. That could create a lot of problems. Now, the fear instinct in response, again, was intended to produce immediate action. When it stays inside of us and just becomes the motivating factor of what we do, it creates adrenaline, which is poison over time, and it's, and it's bad. Years ago, before 9-11 and COVID-19, a guy by the name of uh, Barry Glassner wrote a book called Culture of Fear. And he talks about fear in North America and how it's kind of evolved. He says, we are the most worried culture that has ever existed on the planet before. 
You know, in this topic, the irony of what he's saying is that in the past 100 years, you know, the average life expectancy has more than doubled. We can cure more diseases than ever before, and yet no group of, pe no group of human beings uh, has ever been more obsessed about their health. So there's this kind of this strange irony there. And two years about, of bad news about COVID has made that obsession a lot worse. As you know, people were thinking about it a lot. And then there's an advertising industry whose, basically, whose basic goal is to make you feel insecure about your weight or about the color of your teeth or you know, how your hair is getting gray or about your waistline or stuff like that, basically to get you to buy their stuff. So there's all these things that tend to figure in to our lives. Now, here's the core question, okay? Is there something to be afraid of? And my answer to that question is there will always be something to be afraid of. There will always be something to be afraid of. You can be afraid of just about anything. No matter what the chances, no matter how remote it is that it will ever happen to you. You can be afraid of slipping and falling in the bathtub and never take another bath, okay? Uh, so there always has been something to be afraid of as well. You know, when Jesus walked the planet, you think about what life was like back then. I mean, they had the Romans who were basically crushing the existence out of the world at that time, you know. You didn't mess with Roman soldiers. You had two Roman soldiers that walked past your house. You didn't make cat calls. You didn't attract their attention because they could literally, you know, make sure that you died or suffered a lot of pain. So there was a lot of stuff to be afraid of. You know, back then, you know, you didn't have credit cards. If you had to go and overspend to get something, you know, and you couldn't pay your debt, they would come, they would sell everything you had, your house and everything, and sell your family too. Lots of things to be afraid of. And then there was taxes. Taxes ate up, you know, we think taxes are bad now. They ate up the majority of people's income. Sanitary water, there was no such thing as sanitary water back then. That's why they many times mixed wine with the water to kill the bacteria in it. And if you read about Jesus and the people that he was around, there was a lot of leprosy, just about every kind of disease. There were lots of blind people. There were people who were paralyzed because they couldn't get any, anything. Nearsightedness was, you know, something that was around. If you were nearsighted too bad, you couldn't correct it in any way. So there was lots of stuff back then to, you know, to be afraid of. If you lived long enough, and that would be a big if because life expectancy for guys was about the mid-40s, but if you lived long enough, you know, your retirement plan was your kids. That could be good or it can be not good. Slavery was an ongoing reality. The only real, pe the only uh, free people back in that world, in the world of Jesus' day, were the Roman people. And it's into this context that Jesus says, if I were you, I wouldn't worry. And you think to yourself, well, why? And Jesus basically compared, he basically said, it's absolutely useless. You can't change your height with it. You can't change your hair color. It's a little bit like, you know, putting your car up on blocks and then racing the engine until the engine burns out. You don't go anywhere with it. And Jesus wraps these fears into kind of this clump that basically says, will I have enough? Will I have enough clothes? Will I have enough food? Will I have enough to drink? Will I have enough money to last my lifetime so that I don't, you know, end up having to go visit my kids in a suitcase, you know? Will I, what if I get leprosy? What if I run out of money? What if, what if, what if? And Jesus said, if I were you, I wouldn't worry because you have a Father in heaven who's watching over you and he cares about you. And I'm telling you, if you let fear get into your heart, if you let fear become, you know, the driver of your life, it will likely cause more disease and more health problems for you than actually COVID would ever. I may be assuming that, but I do know that stress and fear and all the junk that goes on inside is actually one of the major, you know, uh, contributing forces to the disease and to death in our world. And Jesus' point was, you have a father who loves you. You feel very much alone, but you are not alone. And he is watching over you and he is caring for you. In your home, if you've invited him into your life, if, if, he've made, uh, if, he've, if you've allowed him to make his home in your heart, the healer lives in there. The prince of peace lives in there. The most powerful force in the universe lives in you, and he will take care of you. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, okay, Kim, well, that's easy for you to say, you know, and I don't even believe that stuff, and that's okay. I, I totally understand it takes time to think that through and make a decision about what you're going to believe. But you, you could tell me you have no idea what it's like to be me, okay? 
and face the problems I face and, and the cocktail of anxiety and fear that I've been brought up with. And you're right, I don't know those things. But then I'm not the one that said, if I were you, I wouldn't worry. Jesus is the one who said that. And God knows exactly how you feel. He knows exactly where you're at in terms of anxiety. And he said, don't let worry run your life. Don't let fear run your life. Specifically, this is what he said. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And listen to this. And he will give you everything that you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Now, my goal is not to shame anybody into not worrying or anything like that, and that's impossible. I can't even do that. But what I want to do today in this first topic, in this first message, in this whole series, is just kind of point you toward the exit ramp. And the first thing that you have to do if you're ever going to exit from this is face the fear and deal with it. Nobody is going to come and remove it from your heart. Nobody's going to come and remove it from your home. You have to face it, and you have to deal with it. The Bible says, quotes God is basically saying, don't be afraid. Fear not is, are the actual words that he used. And you know why? He says, because I'm with you. I'm with you wherever you go. I'm with you wherever you are. And this is said 366 times throughout the entire record. Now, do you think that that's just a mistake? <laughs> well, you know, one for every year, one for every day of the year and leap year included. I, I don't think that's necessarily a mistake. So why would God keep reemphasizing this? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's because it keeps coming up. See, he knew that if we let it get into our hearts, there are some people that it would paralyze them. And that happens. It can just stop you in your tracks and you just never move forward. It can cause other people to sin. One of the main things that people do when they're afraid like this is that they lie. It can keep people from serving him and trusting him and dealing with problems. And especially it can keep us from loving and serving other, th other people. Because fear, when it gets into us like this, is basically a selfish motivation. Because we tend to think about ourselves and about our problems and about what could threaten us 24-7. Now, I'd like to tell you two stories about fear, and then we're done. And we're going to take some thoughts from them, okay? And, uh, and we're going to take them in chronological order. And the first one is one that you've heard many, many times before. Probably heard it in Sunday school or, you know, some kind of day camp or something like that. And it's about this little kid who faced down this giant, and then they wrote songs about him, and he went down in history. And you probably sang the song, you know, when you were at some point, you know, only a boy named David, only a rippling brook, you know. And it goes on to tell the story of how this little kid did this. Well, you know, actually, it's a little bit misleading, the song is, because he wasn't just a little kid. He was probably in his teens at that point. And uh, you get into 1 first, uh, first Samuel chapter 17, and it kind of tells a more complete story of this. Now, the story starts with two armies, the Israelites and the Philistines, and they're kind of facing, uh, on, they're on opposite sides of this valley, the Valley of Elah. And they periodically will step out from where they're hiding and so on and, and where their defenses are and yell at each other, and then they go back. This goes on for 40 days, okay, 40 days of this. So David gets asked by his dad. He's a shepherd, so he's out watching the sheep, so he has somebody else step into his place, and he listens to his dad. His dad gives him some bread and cheese to go out and give to his brothers. He has seven brothers all together. There's eight sons. So he has seven brothers. Three of them are fighting for Saul out in this battle against the Philistines. Now, here's something that you need to know going into this text here, going into this story. Just previous to this incident, uh, Saul had basically been rejected by, as king by God. And God told Samuel to go and find this kid out there, this shepherd, the son of Jesse, and to anoint him as the next king of Israel. And so Samuel did this right in front of all the other brothers, in front of his whole family. So they all knew this, okay? So, and that day it tells us that the Spirit of God came on him in power. Now, why do you think that happened? What well, happened so he could do the job. And he did the job really well once he, once he got into, uh, into the role as king. So he's not just a bystander. He's not out there with a food truck, you know, uh, or kind of, you know, the waiter kind of bringing the food to his brothers. He brings the food to them, and he sees what's going on out there. Now, his brothers 
especially Eliab, who's the big brother. And, and this is the one where, Saul, where uh, Samuel went in and said, Ooh, surely he's the God's anointed. He looked big and strong. You know, he's got to be the guy. Well, he wasn't the guy. So he's out there you know, on the front lines. He's the oldest brother. David comes out there, and he's asking questions about Goliath, about this guy that comes out and challenges everybody to a fight. And, uh, and so his brother said, you're just out here. You're an ambulance chaser. You just want to see a little bit of blood and guts. You know, you want to come, you're just out here curiosity sex. So he puts them down. But what David realized is that these troops here who are cowering in front of Goliath and then the other, and the other troops out there, he's going to be the one leading them someday. He's going to be king over this country. So he's not thinking you know, and doing what his brother says. Now, one of the interesting things that comes up is that you find that fear many times creates anger. And that's what you see in Eliab because he's the oldest, he's the oldest brother. He doesn't want this little kid brother coming out and seeing that he's afraid. Nobody wants to see that. And so that many times creates anger in us. And that's one of the things that you'll see perhaps through your own fear and certainly through these stories is this anger. Now, what's going on, of course, is that this monstrous warrior on the Philistine side, Goliath, he's the one, he's coming out and challenging. He says, hey, let's just do this. Let's one-on-one, you know, send out your best soldier. We'll duke it out. And whoever, you know, wins, the other side will serve them for the rest of their lives. So this, there's, lots of, lots of, there's lots of things on this. There's a lot of staked on this whole claim that he's making. So David goes through the right channels. He goes to Saul the king, and he says, I think, you know, I'm supposed to go out and fight this guy. Now, when you think about this, you know, David is probably in his teens at this point, could be early to mid-teens, and Saul is thinking to himself, do I send this kid out there and kind of set the whole fate for my country as being slaves of the Philistines, depending on how he does? I would have had questions about that. But he says, no. And so he decides to lend uh, David his armor. So David tries this stuff on, and of course, it's all too big. Meanwhile, you know, Goliath is out there making his charge. Come on out. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to, you know, it didn't hurt you really bad, you know. So he tries this on, but then he realizes, and he's strategic in this. This is really important to see in David, that if he puts this armor on, he's going to lose the only strategic value uh, advantage that he has. And that is that he can duck, (laughs) that he can get out of the way of this guy, that he can be agile and move around. So he decides he's not going to do this, and he goes out there and takes this guy on, okay? Now, the other thing that you see in David is his strategic understanding of power and how it works. Because he says to Saul, he says, I've been out shepherd, and he said, there have been times when I've had to actually kill a lion or kill a bear to get the lamb away from it. And I grabbed them and I killed them. So, you know, Goliath, as big as this guy is, and he's nine and a half feet tall, you know, he's, he's, he's mortal. He's a human being. And he would be killed by a bear or a lion if it attacked him. So you just have to understand the reality of this. So this guy is jumbo sized by any imagination. Now, here's something uh, that I just want to say at this point, and I think this fits into this story. I'm at my worst when I'm afraid. I am at my worst when I'm afraid. And love isn't something that I do well when I'm afraid. And I'm guessing that you're probably the same way, which is why fear is so destructive in us. And that's why David has to basically deal with this. Now listen to what he says. He's not talking about, you know, how tough he is and everything like that. He's basically saying, you know, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, he's got a sling, and this isn't like one of those little Y-shaped things that, you know, kids stick in their back pockets and so on. This is a sling that they used in battle and had leather thongs on it with a big leather patch in it, and they would put a rock this size. The guys who used these slings, particularly the shepherds, they could practice all day. They were really good at it. So imagine a rock like this traveling at about 100 miles an hour and hitting you in the head. They could do some serious damage, right? So David goes out there, and of course, Goliath is doing what all bullies do. You know, I'm going to kill you, you know, and I'm going to take you down, and I'm going to feed you to the birds and the animals and all this stuff. It says, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you because I'm such a tough guy. I might be small, but I'm wary. No, that's not what he says. He says, you know, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. And this very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds 
and the wild animals and the whole world, listen to this, will know not how powerful I am. They will not, you know, my name will go down, you know, I'll be famous someday because I did this. No, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. What's fascinating about this story is that God is in charge. This is kind of the way the metrics worked in David's mind. Everybody around him, including his big brother, are saying, this guy is so much bigger than me, I don't stand a chance. So if you measure, measure this in terms of feet, you know, there's David. He's probably about five feet tall, maybe not, probably not too much more than that. Goliath, he's almost 10 feet tall, so he's clear up here. But David wasn't measuring himself against Goliath. He was measuring Goliath against his God. And there's no comparison there. Listen to what happened. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David, and this is really important to understand, ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. You have to run towards your fear. You have to face your fears. And reaching into his bag, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. It said the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand and he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Now, I want you, I'm going to tell you another reason why David knew he had to do this. It had probably been about maybe four or 500 years before this when the Israelites had come out of Egypt. They'd seen the power and the might of God bring them out of Israel, and yet they get right up to the, up to the boundary, the Jordan River, where they're supposed to go into the Promised Land. And the spies went into the land, and they saw the Anakites. Uh, Goliath was an Anakite. He was a whole you know, tribe of giant people. And they said, we felt like grasshoppers. We were scared to death. And it was, that's the reason why they stayed there at the river, and then they wandered in the desert for the next 40 years. It became really clear that they had defied God by basically not going in and taking on what they were supposed to do. And that day, David's trust in God and his courage in facing this massive warrior inspired the whole family, and they took out the Philistine army. And one of the things they realized is that Goliath, a big guy, giant guy, very strong, but he's just a human being. That's all he is. He can be taken out by a, a, a stone like this, or he can be taken out by a virus like COVID, just a human being. Now, I want you to notice, again, Notice what's going on here. He ran towards the line, and he ran towards his fear. He faced his fear. That's what you have to do. Because I'll tell you, if you start running from your fears, you'll be running the rest of your life. They will chase you down until you're exhausted. You have to face fear. You have to face it and deal with it. One more story, and we're done. A thousand years later, Jesus, who was the son of David, He's in a boat with 12 terrified men. Now, he had told his disciples, okay, we're going to go to the other side. And you have to understand that the other side was basically this scary place because it was where the Romans camped. It was where they had their troops. Uh, it was filled with pigs. It was filled with demons. And, and they were going to be going over there. And these guys were scared to death to go there. The other side was not where they wanted to be. So sure enough, they get in the boat, and Jesus falls asleep. He's in the back of the boat, as you can see there, sleeping. And, you know, and they hit this massive storm. Now, you have to understand, in the Sea of Galilee, these guys, two, four of these guys at least were sailors, and they knew that this has nasty storms. Like, it can come up. They had a wave that came up when we visited there. They showed us, you know, where this wave had come up and taken out this whole port because it was so huge, because the storm was so bad. So anyway, so they're heading toward the other side. And they get to this storm. Let me read the storm uh, story for you. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat. I don't know if you've ever been in a boat in a bad storm, but I'm telling you, you know, you want to hope that the Coast Guard is available and that there are life jackets under the seats. They didn't have either of them. And it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. And then the disciples woke him up, shouting. I, wonder, I want you to understand, again, this is anger. Okay, they're afraid and it brings about anger. Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Jesus woke up. He rebuked the wind. He was angry too. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. You know, quiet down out there. Stop this. And suddenly the wind stopped. And it was a great calm. 
And then he asked them, you know, what do you guys think of that? Wasn't that cool? No, he says, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Disciples were absolutely terrified. All of a sudden, they've got something new to be afraid of. It's not the other side. It's not the storm. It's the guy in the boat. It's Jesus. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. And that fits, doesn't it? It fits with everything that we, we are taught through sacred history. That don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid of the circumstances. Fear God. In other words, don't be afraid of them. Don't, you know, cower in front of them. But respect the fact that you have God with you in your boat. Now, Jesus had planned uh, this trip, you know, for them. And you can understand their frustration. He's asleep in the back of the boat, and they're in big trouble and so on. And, and again, they're angry at him. And Jesus' immediate response is to just, you know, treat the, treat the storm like it's a naughty child. Stop it. Stop fooling around out there, you know. And, of course, it did. You know, when the wind went through and I was out running, you know, remember the storm that we had back in the long weekend in May and, you know, and the tornado came through? I stood in the middle of the road and I tried that. Stop it. Stop. Well, actually, I didn't. You know, I was cowering, you know, in, in the doorway of an old church rather than trying to rebuke the wind and the waves because I don't have that kind of power, okay? Now, what's interesting here are the next words that Jesus says. He asks, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Uh, Jesus, have you looked at the waves? Do you see that the boat's filling up with water here? Do you understand that we're going to this nasty place that we really don't want, you know, with pig-eating, you know, Romans and so on, and we could get killed while we're there? But the next part points out where they needed to go with their fear. The disciples were suddenly terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. One of the things that they would clearly understand by the end of their time with Jesus is they had God in their boat. God was in the boat with them. And I want you to notice where the fear went. First, you know, they're afraid of their destination, then the storm, and then Jesus is the one who has their respect. In the middle of this mess, you see, it becomes clear that they can go anywhere with Jesus because they're safe with him. He knows exactly how to handle They got to the other side of this lake. I don't know if you know the story. This is about the madman in the tombs. This guy was possessed by, you know, hundreds of demons apparently. And he was one scary person. He's screaming at Jesus by the time, you know, even before he got out of the boat, you know. He had terrorized that whole part of the world. Jesus cleanses them just like that, tells the demons to leave. And by the end of the day, you've got a calm sea, You've got a person who's clothed and in his right ma mind, wants to follow Jesus. He wants to go in the boat with Jesus back to the other side. Jesus sends him as a missionary to the people who knew him. You know, this is what I was. You knew me, man. I was crazy, you know. This is who I am now. Jesus made the difference. And I'm telling you, he made a huge difference in this community because Jesus has the power to do that. And for us, if we're going to ever stare down fear, uh, fear then our faith has to shift from the destination we're scared of, you know, and the storm du jour because there are going to be plenty of storms to be afraid of and wonder if it's going to take you out. And it has to go to Jesus. Jesus, my life is yours. You are the one who has charge over me. You are the one who has, is in charge of all the circumstances that I'm facing. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because I'm with you. And I think Jesus' question, where's your faith? He could be asking two separate things here. In other words, what happened to your faith? I mean, at one point, and for us, you know, you put your faith in me to, you know, save you from your sin, to give you a home forever, and to, and to change your life. That's bigger than anything you're ever going to face. That's bigger than any germ. That's bigger than any virus you're ever going to face. You put your faith in me for that. Why won't you put your faith in me for the circumstances that you find yourself in? The second question is what or who are you actually putting your faith in? Where are you build he At the end of his talk and where he talked about worry, he basically asked us, you know, where are you going to build your foundation? Because you better build on a rock. And I'm telling you, you know, there's lots of different stuff that we've used to deal with this virus. That's all good stuff. You know, Lysol, you want to clean things off, right? And then... 
You know, there's a hand sanitizer. You know, we've used a ton of that. Whoever makes this stuff is making a lot of money off of it. And then the face mask, my word, the face mask companies are doing well. But ultimately, you have to ask yourself the question, where's my faith? Is my faith is in the healthcare system? Is my faith in, you know, what the news is telling me and what I need to be afraid of on, on any given day? Is it, is Am I, putting, am I building my future on mass? Am I building it on plexiglass shields? Am I building it on Lysol? Am I building it on, you know, the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm going to, my body's going to, what am I building my house on? And I want to ask you, where are you going to build? Where are you going to build your life? Because you want to build on God's power and life, because that's the only foundation that's going to get you through when the ultimate storm hits your life, which is death. Now, I am not trying to shame anybody. I'm not trying to do any of that, okay? But we have to live with courageous faith. And I'll tell you why. It's because Jesus' mission is dependent on us actually reaching out to people. If you're afraid of people, how are you going to reach them? How are you going to accomplish the mission? I mean, think about it, you know? You think that, I mean, he makes allowances for our fear. He, He works with us in our fear, and he helps us with our fears. But, you know... I don't think Jesus will ever say, you know, it's okay for you to just to, you know, get afraid and just run away from the mission and run away from me and run away from everything else and sit in the corner of your house and suck your thumb until the storm passes by. I don't think that's what he wants. I don't think that's what he blesses. I think that he is able to handle things and he wants us to turn to him. He wants us to believe that he is good, that he's a father who is watching over us and sees all the circumstances on our, in our lives. And that's what you see in this story. Jesus was in charge of the other side before they even got there. Jesus was in charge of the storm, you know, before it went up, when it went up, and after it went up. Jesus was in charge of the boat. Jesus was in charge of his mission. Jesus was watching over his disciples. He's saying, will you trust me or not? Because whether or not you will ever accomplish this mission that we're on is going to depend on whether or not you trust me. Now we're going to continue to talk through some of these things about fear and so on, but there's some takeaways from these stories that I'd like to just talk about for a few minutes. And the first one is this. From the exterior of things, I'm telling you, there are some very real things in our world to be afraid of. And COVID has been one of them, obviously. It's unseen, stopped our world dead in its tracks, affected, you know, seven and a half million people, I mean, billion people. This is, this is kind of the common experience we have. It's a proven killer, killer. It shut down, you know, everything, and it scared some of you to death. And I'm guessing it probably ruined some of your friendships because it had a way of doing that. It got very, very divisive. So this caution. You have to be cautious we're, in, in cult, we're told to be, to be cautious, but is this what you want to hand your mission over to? Is this something you want to hand your life over to? Hand your, over your ability to love and to smile and to help and to engage in other people's lives? I don't think it is. See, life is short, and we have these opportunities to make a difference, and fear can steal that from you. Something else. Our fear tends to make us angry. And sometimes, like I said, you know, when I'm, when I'm afraid, I am not who I want to be. Fear is a thief. Fear will steal things from your life. Fear will steal your confidence. And, and I'll tell you what, what, what else will happen and so on. It will also make you proud and you will, you know, like the song says, you know, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Because to back down from something that you've said you're afraid of and say, yeah, it wasn't a big deal at all. That's almost impossible for us to do. Fear can ruin lots of stuff in your life. There's a lot more to talk about when it comes to fear and so on, but the worst thing for fear is the paralysis that it causes in our lives. It causes us to freeze. It causes us to freeze in what we're doing, and it keeps us from what God has called us to do. Here's what I know. Reaching out to other people, touching other people, being with people face to face is going to be difficult after we have been told for, you know, two years that it's dangerous to our health. But I'm telling you, eventually, maybe, you know, it's going to be different for each of us. But eventually, that's where we have to go because that's the mission of Jesus. 
Mission of Jesus is not about us all memorizing the Bible and, you know, keeping, you know, all this truth tanked up in ourselves. It's about reaching out to other people. Jesus said as much. Listen to what he said, and this is very important to understand. If any of you wants to be my follower, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your way and take up your cross daily. You have to understand, you know, we have crosses at the front of the church here. People, you know, there are crosses on top of buildings. People wear them around their necks and dangle them from their ears. And crosses everywhere. But you have to understand, Jesus' reference to this was not, at that point, this was a scary, terrifying prospect. Take up your cross and follow me. That was like going to the other side. It was worse than that. Jesus was saying that following him is not always going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. And if you're looking for a comfortable ride where you, know, you don't have to have any fear again in your life, this is not going to be it. But then he goes on to say, if you try to hang on to your life, if you try to, in fear, clutch onto your life, sink your nails into it, keep it from getting away from you, he said, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. In other words, man, entrust it to me. Entrust it to me. Caution? Absolutely. Fear? Absolutely not. It's not our calling. Our calling isn't fear. Faith is believing God when the circumstances are good and when the circumstances get really scary and you don't see any way out. And I'm telling you, I have been there. I have been there. And God is faithful. I'm going to close with a passage here. This is something that you probably have heard before, but it comes out of Romans chapter 8. And it says this, if God is for us, if God is for us, and he is, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. You can be afraid, but you don't have to. Because you see, fear has a price tag on it. And I don't think you want to pay the price of living in fear. As I pray today, mentally or maybe even physically, I want to encourage you to think about what you're most afraid of, what is right front and center, which is the storm that you're in, which is this giant that you're facing. And what I want you to do is just say, God, would you please help me with this because I don't want to live in fear. God, I don't know where people are when they're listening to this, at what point in their lives, what they've just faced, what they think they're going to face, what they know they're going to face. We have all kinds of things that scare us to death about the safety of our kids, safety of our own lives and our health and our futures, all these things, God. That's just part of what it means to be human. It's the uncertainty. Help us in the uncertainty to trust you. God, we hold up to you these big, ugly, smelly giants that would cause us to be afraid, that would freeze us in our tracks, that would tempt us to run the other direction. And we give them to you. We trust them to you because that's what you've told us to do. Help us, God, to keep our faith intact in the scary times of life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to worship and then we're going to come back.
So may the God who holds your life in his hands give you the confidence that he doesn't just hold your physical life. He holds everything else in his hands because he's big, way bigger than any giant, any fear that you're facing. May God give you peace about that. Amen.